Hello and welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 18. Well done for getting this far if you have. Um, we've been doing some uh, quite hardcore difficult stuff. Um, it's going to get a bit simpler, more practical. We're going to be talking about um, cargo and how to build your stuff. So yeah, previously, in previous lots of previous videos, we looked at how to write generic code, how to write traits and how to use the traits in the standard library, uh, how to do generic stuff with traits and associated types with things, traits, and uh, we also did lifetime annotations, which is where it gets really tricky. So all the stuff about like Rust the language. So look back at those videos. Um, feel free to watch them as many times as you like, if you can bear it. Um, it takes some getting your head around. This time it's going to be much more straightforward. We're going to talk about like practical stuff that you need to just be able to write Rust code and do your, do your work. So... Um, in this video, we're just going to be talking about how to use other people's Rust code, um, uh, and we'll get on to some of these other topics later. So, uh, yeah, working with crates is our, our, our section that we're doing today. So um, when, uh, when you've been um, creating Rust projects, you'll already have used the cargo command to either init or create a project, and you'll be aware that it created a cargo.toml file, um, uh, but maybe you haven't thought much about what that does. So this time we're going to talk a little bit, only a little bit more about what you can do with Cargo and Cargo.toml. So Cargo is just the thing that builds Rust code. Um, so you use it a lot. And here is a list of some things you do with it. Create new projects, manage dependencies as in other people's Rust code that you're using, uh, actually compiling it and building it into an executable. It can also run the executable immediately. Uh, also really nice ways of running tests and things like that. And it will generate offline documentation. It will download and set up all the documentation so you've got it on your machine, um, which makes it really fast and also usable when you don't have internet and stuff like that. So um, uh, that's one of the things I really like about Rust. That, um, you can get all that really nice usable documentation uh, really fast and local on your machine. Okay, so... Um, I mentioned a cargo.toml file. So here is an example of a cargo.toml file. You've probably seen this if you followed the other videos, uh, but may not have thought too much about it. Um, so it's it's in toml format, which looks a bit like a windows.ini file, um, but essentially it has like sections in these square brackets and then name equals value. And these values can be a bit more complicated than just a string, but often they just look like this. So um, if you're familiar with um, package.json in, in node.js or, or like composer in PHP or like most languages these days, even like poetry, a poetry file in Python, um, Ruby gems uh, files have it. Um, look, most languages these days, there'll be a like a config file you can put in your main directory that just says this is this is what this project consists of. This is the things dependencies it uses as in other code it, it uses. Um, this is its name, its license, blah, blah, blah. So all that stuff goes in cargo.toml. Note the capital C in cargo.toml. Uh, that needs to be there. Um, and yeah, so the, the package section is where you talk about like what, what the name of the project is and other stuff about this, this whole package. And dependencies is where you list things that you depend on and their versions. So let's talk a little bit more about dependencies. So why would you use a dependency? It's basically because someone else has written some code that you want to make use of. Um, and uh, Rust has this great big list of dependencies that other people have made. And like you need to decide what level of trust you have on those things, um, which will be a combination of like how many other people are using this thing. Um, have you read a blog post that said it was good? Um, uh, reading the code yourself and deciding whether it's suitable. Generally, you want to keep the number of dependencies you use as low as possible, but there's so much excellent, useful quality code uh, in Rust that um, it would be uh, strange in most contexts not to use some of it. Um, there are also some dependencies which are so widely used, you could almost think of them as being like a little extended bit of the standard library. Um, one example is Serdi, uh, which is the one that was listed here, which helps you do serialization and deserialization. Uh, okay, so um, the simplest way to add a dependency, well, not the simplest, a way to add a dependency um, is to just add a line in your in your uh, cargo.toml saying, 
um, I want to use this dependency and this version. And it, it knows to go and look that up in the standard Rust place um, for that name, Itatools, which also, by the way, is a really cool uh, piece of code worth looking at. Uh, helps you do more stuff with iterators. Um, but these days, because it's relatively recent, there's a simpler way. You don't have to go and look up which version you want to use. You just say cargo add Itatools, or the name of your dependency, and Rust will add like the latest stable version of that dependency, I guess, or the, the sensible version of that. And then, by the way, uh, if you want to change what version you depend on later, you just change it in cargo.toml. And then you say like cargo build or cargo run or whatever, and it will go fetch the version you asked for. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about dependencies and this word crates. So crates is just Rust's word for like a bundled up bit of Rust code that you can use a dependency. Um, and there's two different types of crates, same, same as there's two different types of things, programs you can write in Rust. There's binary crates, which are things that are basically programs that you can run. And there's library crates, which is the one you'll normally use when you're doing uh, cargo add. Um, so they, they give you basically functions that you can call from your Rust. By the way, all these dependencies, when you're building in Rust, they're all, you always download the source code of them because with any generic code or anything like that, um, uh, the Rust compiler needs access to the source code in order to actually generate the real code that's actually going to be in your program, right? So, um, like, there, there's not really... Is that right? Yeah, basically, um, in Rust, when you're using someone else's code, you're using their source code. Um, that you can, like, you can link to... You can do more difficult stuff, but your normal thing is going to be that, okay? Um, okay, so... Um, just like in the code that we've been writing ourselves, if you've, if you're making a binary, you'll end up with a file called main.rs. And if you're making a library, there'll be, uh, probably be a file called lib.rs. So that will be inside that crate that you're using. You won't have to worry about that when you're just using it as a dependency. Um, but let's have a look at what it looks like in your code to use a crate. But before we do that, I just want to just ha have a quick show of crates.io. So this is the like official place. There are other listings of Rust crates, by the way. They all list the same list of crates as I understand it, but they just make it easier to understand in different ways. But yeah, crates.io is the official place where Rust crates live. Uh, crates are just dependencies. And so if we search for a crate, for example, Serdi, which I've already said is a, a really excellent serialization, deserialization framework, you can see the top result type search for Serdi is Serdi. And if I click through, we can find a bit more information about Serdi. And this, this is all got from its readme file, which is part of its code repository. You've got a link to uh, its documentation, a link to the, the actual code. And also in this case, it has like a, a homepage, which is maybe fairly unusual, which explains more stuff about it. Um, uh, so there's, there's some documentation about how to use it. So once you've, once you've gone through crates.io and found the thing that you think would be interesting, you can do cargo add serdi like this. And it will add it and it will add it at this version. Um, because that's like the sensible version to be using at this time. Um, and we can also, normally there's a link to documentation. So if you click on that, you can go through to, uh, this kind of API documentation. And then if we want to learn about, I don't know, how to do uh, serializing things to JSON and back. Um, then, then, yeah, then we get, um, I had to do two jumps there, I don't know why, but then you got some examples and documentation about how to do things with JSON, like, oh, look, here's a JSON literal, I want to turn that into some kind of um, class hierarchy that I can use in my Rust code. Serdi JSON, very useful to me. Uh, Crates.io, very useful to everyone to find crates that you are on the topic that you, you whatever you're searching for. Okay, um, so that was like how you find a dependency that you might like to use. Again, like I said, you need to check, like if some random person on the internet has uploaded a dependency um, to crates.io, no one is checking to say, oh, this, this is not a malicious piece of code, right? So you've got to do your due diligence, make sure you trust the author of that code, um, how you build that trust is, is you know, an unsolved problem, <laughs> but hopefully you have some ways of, of figuring that stuff out. Um, and if you're doing like security critical work, you're going to need to be much more diligent about that. You might need to audit the code, pick a version, stick to that version because you've audited it, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're doing something where it's less security critical, you might be happy with 
I read a blog post and someone said um, something was good. Uh, there is also, well, that's a good point. Let me show you. There is also um, blessed.rs, I think it is. Um, yeah, okay. So this is, it's unofficial. So um, I don't know who the author of this is, but I have found that I agree with a lot of the recommendations on this website. This is a place which tells you um, widely used crates that a lot of people trust for different uh, tasks. So finding random numbers, a lot of people use the RAND crate, uh, me included. Doing stuff with time, people use the time and the chrono crates. For serialization, everyone uses 30. Regular expressions, everyone uses regex. Apparently there's fancy regex as well. Um, and so on, like different types of array. Uh, HTTP requests, um, I've used the request library with a W, very, very useful. Anyhow, so there's, there's loads, loads of things that I, that I'm seeing in this list as I scroll through. I would recommend. Um, except I think once cell, yeah, they say once cell has now been moved into the standard library, so you don't need to use once cell anymore. Um, it's a tools we've already mentioned. Um, if you get into macros, this stuff is really useful. So yeah, tons of, so, um, my current, obviously, I don't know the author of this website, but my current recommendation is that this website has Loads of stuff in it that I find um, really useful and I've used and found to work, including Tokyo for async stuff. Uh, yeah, so try blessed.rs. Blessed.rs? Not sure. Um, for, like, recommendations in some sense of uh, crates that are widely used. Um, normal caveat supply still about um, trust. Okay, so... Uh, how do you use a, a dependency that you've added? So you've, you've done your cargo add, you've added something like tracing as a dependency. Um, and uh, you want to use that in your code. So I'm just noticing here, I think this probably should say create colon colon. Oh, no, no, this is, yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah this is some code that is, um, I guess this is some kind of external code using your code. Um, uh, like a integration test or something like that. So this is my app. Uh, this is how I get hold of stuff from my app. But the important thing I want to talk about is um, if you've added tracing as a dependency, then to use stuff from inside tracing, you can just say use tracing colon colon and then the thing. And now this word info is available to you in your code, which means you can just use it here. Um, and the other way you can do it is you can just say tracing colon colon blah in your code inline and either of those once it's in once it's been cargo added to your cargo.toml um, and you've done like a cargo build or cargo check or something so that it's actually gone and fetched those dependencies for you um, you can refer to things inside that crate by just using its name and in most cases the name here is going to be the same as the name that you cargo added but there is one caveat to that which is if the crate name contains like a minus sign or some, uh, something else that's not allowed in Rust code as an identifier, it's going to get translated into an underscore. So, um, uh, I don't know, does the SERDI, SERDI JSON use a dash or an underscore? No, it doesn't. Okay. Imagine, imagine SERDI, what JSON was called SERDI dash JSON, like this one is. Um, then, if you actually, if you did a cargo add serdy dash JSON and it worked, which you wouldn't here because it's the wrong name, but if that name had a dash in it, when you used it in your code, you'd have to say use serdy underscore JSON. So that's a bit of a gotcha. But anyway, generally, um, the, the crate that you've cargo added will be available under its name just by saying use it or just by saying, uh, like fully listing the name of the thing. So it's just been added to the kind of general namespace of your, uh, code by doing that cargo add. Okay, what else? Um, yeah, so um, dependencies are normally got from crates.io, in which case you just say, um, you just say like dependency name equals version. But actually on the right hand side, as I said, you can have more complicated stuff. So you might want to use only some features from a crate, in which case you'd have a curly bracket version equals blah, comma features equals blah, um, and stuff like that. And I'll show you a link to the, the reference so you can see how all this stuff works in a second. But the other thing you can do is grab dependencies from other places. So you can either grab dependencies from your local disk by just saying path equals, and then like the relative path relative to this cargo.toml to the, um, to and some other Rust 
project. So somewhat this inside this directory, there'll be another cargo.toml. Um, but or you can say git equals and then directly refer to a git repository, including like a commit or a branch that you want to specify. So you can work against like an experimental version of someone's code. I mean, I wouldn't recommend that necessarily, but you can do it. And you can also work against an experimental version of your own code. There are also ways of adding an extra file that overrides this stuff just for your local directory so that you could be working against an experimental branch locally, but then not commit that to your repo. So there's all kinds of, like, like Cargo can do all kinds of clever stuff. Um, apparently there are different registries, like at some point they might be able to have completely different registries, um, but that's a work in progress. Um, okay, so that was it for um, Cargo. One other thing I want to show you is the Cargo book, which is at doc.rustlang.org slash cargo slash reference. Well, there's more stuff. Anyway, so search for the Cargo book and you should find it. Um, and there's there's tons of information about what your cargo.toml file can have in it, basically, and other stuff you can do with Cargo, um, including information about what the toml file format, how the toml file format works by linking out to there. But yeah, I just wanted to show you briefly um, the package section, which is the one that just tells you about your project. Um, you can put all kinds of stuff in there, like the authors, the license, um, the the, li the link to the license file, keywords people might use to search for it. Um, just loads of stuff that I don't understand. And then also there's the dependencies section, which is what which we've already talked about. There's also dev dependencies, which is dependencies that you need in order to uh, run your tests and stuff like that, but shouldn't be used to build the final package. There's other types of dependencies. Um, and then if we look inside the dependencies section, it tells us a bit more about. So the simple form is just dependency name equals and then version. Uh, you can also do stuff with version numbers, uh, clever stuff with version numbers, uh, and the, the uh, Semver compatible things saying, um, I need exactly, I need this or higher, which is, I think is what that means. Um, and that, yeah, and like you can say, I think you can say like I need exactly this version, or uh, you can use wildcards. Um, and yeah, this is so. This is the kind of more complex setup of um, uh, instead of just saying create name equals and then double quotes version number, you can do more stuff if you put this curly bracket and then say version equals blah, which you still need to say the version, but then you can say the registry key, I don't know what that means, um, but I've used that to specify what features. Here's an example of Git, Git and specifying the branches. Um, you can also have optional dependencies, uh, which, uh, which are only um, included if you've included a feature, and we haven't talked about features. So there's, yeah, let's briefly, let's jump to the features section. So features are a way of uh, people using your crate to say, um, I want this extra bit of code, or I don't want this extra bit of code. So if you're if you're writing your own code, you can add, add a features section to your cargo.toml, um, give it a name, and then like any other dependencies that it makes happen if you, if people choose this feature. But then inside your code, you can say only this stuff only exists um, if this feature has been chosen by the user. And you can say whether that feature is on by default or off by default. So yeah, I'm not going to try and get into all the details of that. But yeah, this cargo book can tell you everything you need to know about um, using dependencies that have features. Um, like you will often need the derive feature when you're using Surdy. That's a little tip for you. Um, so you'll need to not just say Surdy equals blah, but actually do that... Um, uh, curly bracket thing. Now, can I see an example of... Yeah, here we are. So when I'm using Surdy... Oh, this is, <laughs> I've used exactly the example I use in this documentation. Whenever I'm using Surdy, I say Surdy equals curly bracket, and then version equals whatever version I want, and then features equals, and I will definitely include derive, and I might include some other Surdy features in there. So that's how you add a dependency and say, I don't just want the default set of features... I want this derived feature as well. And Surdy has uh, not many features turned on by default because it's very widely used. So um, it doesn't want to be compiling extra code that you didn't need unless you ask for it. All right. So um, a bit of waffling there, but basically um, 
uh, cargo.toml is where you define your project. Adding dependencies is just by typing cargo add dependency name. You can find your dependencies on crates.io. You can find out which dependencies are widely used on blessed.rs. And you can learn more about the cargo file format and features and all that stuff by searching for the cargo book. Uh, thanks a lot. See you next time.